Thank you for your continued interest in our study of God's prophetic word. We continue to look at some of the major uh, prophecies uh, concerning nations at the time of the Old Testament with the intention of seeing how they are fulfilled and how God keeps his word. Last uh, week, we looked at Babylon, prior to that, Assyria, and today we'll look at Phoenicia and Philistia, these two areas along the coast of the Mediterranean known as the Levant. Each time so far, we've been able to identify some rather spectacular or outstanding, interesting, intriguing incident, and we'll do that today also as we study Tyre. And Tyre and Sidon together, I'm calling this the amazing bisected prophecy against Tyre. Now, first of all, what do you talk about with Phoenicia? What do we mean by Phoenicia? Phoenicia was an ancient Semitic thalassocratic civilization originating in the coastal strip of the Levant region of the Eastern Mediterranean. Maybe you need to stop and explain that. Uh, of Semitic uh, meaning descended from Shem, and that means a relationship to the Hebrews. Thalassocratic, well, that word comes from thalassos, which is the Greek word for, for sea. So that, and that is based on the sea, oriented toward the sea. That means shipping. That means fishing. It means that they're not going to be focused on the land. They are along the coast of the Eastern Mediterranean. That area is known as the Levant. The major cities in Phoenicia, Tyre, Sidon, Byblos, Arwad. If Byblos sounds like Bible, indeed, that's the, the case. The Bible is derived from that because paper was uh, made in, in Byblos in early times. The Phoenician language is an extinct Canaanite Semitic language originally spoken in the region surrounding the cities of Tyre and Sidon. The dates for Phoenicia, as you see, are 1500 to 300 BC. That puts it in the time of uh, the high point of the Hebrew kingdom. 1500 is probably the time of Moses bringing the uh, law. Uh, and then, of course, subsequent to that, uh, Joshua bringing the Hebrews into Canaan, the promised land. Uh, some would date a little bit later. But the point is that the Phoenicians are contemporary with the Hebrews, up to 300. And of course, the Hebrews uh, will be uh, will continue. This was subsequent to the uh, exile in into Babylon. At 300 is a date that pretty well marks the uh, Alexander the Great. And he, he will have an influence on the whole area because he's going to turn it into his great empire. Now, because of their focus on the sea and sea trade, they were not intrinsically enemies of the Hebrews. I think that's an important point. They were not interested in taking the land from the Hebrews. They were interested in their fishing enterprises, in their uh, trade enterprises via the sea. That would explain why we find... Hiram of Tyre, the king of Tyre, assisting Solomon in the building of the temple. He's providing materials for that, and David in the building of his house. And Hiram of Tyre was not only a friend of the Hebrews, he was a very capable ruler. Tyre is, among the Phoenician cities, the most important. And while we're talking about the cities and the range, arrangement of them, they are a confederation of independent city-states consisting of maritime traders rather than a defined country. Much like the Greeks were. The Greeks had independent city-states. It was not a nation of Greece for a long time. And the same way with the Phoenicians. They were clustered together in this area along the Mediterranean, but they were not united into a single state. They're all independent. The uh, development of Phoenicia 
They will emerge as significant after the decline of Egypt in 1175. Egypt had its great days earlier with its old kingdom, middle kingdom, new kingdom. But by this time, uh, Egypt is declining. And uh, the Phoenicians are going to come along. But not only the Phoenicians, there's a group of people that are known as the Sea Peoples. That means they're not... Uh, identified as particular people, but it's a group of maritime people, uh, groups, that will operate in the Mediterranean area and have a great influence on the development of civilizations. The Phoenicians are just one of the sea peoples. Perhaps the greatest accomplishment of the Phoenicians is that they colonized Carthage in North Africa. As a colony, they would be related to the uh, Phoenicians in trade, uh, in treaties, therefore, and working together. And Carthage goes on to be very, very great. Carthage will be involved with both the Greeks and Romans and will be a part of the Great War uh, when Persia attacked uh, the Greeks and was trying to take over Greece. Then uh, Carthage attacked them also. And so Carthage and Persia worked together against the Greeks. Uh, the Carthaginians focused on the Greeks in the West, area known as the Western uh, Greek lands uh, or Magna Graecia. That's the south part of Italy and Sicily in particular, whereas the Persians will focus on the main area of Greece or the Eastern section of the Greeks. And it is certainly to the credit of the Greeks that they were able to defeat both the Carthaginians and the Persians. And then later, when the Romans come along, they are very much involved with uh, the Carthaginians. I'm sure you've heard of Hannibal. Uh, so they uh, have become, had a great reputation, very powerful city of Carthage. They are Phoenician. Now, all of the Phoenicians are heavily influenced by Egypt and by Egyptian culture. So let's take a look at the map. You see Phoenicia on the upper part of this map in the uh, rather red uh, coloring. And then down below is uh, Philistia. We'll look at that next. There were five great Philistine cities, Tyre and Sidon and the others uh, in Phoenicia. Now in this map on the left, you'll see more clearly uh, the location and relationship of these two areas, these two uh, civilizations to the Hebrews, to Israel. Uh, they're Phoenician and the Philistines are in the yellow color on the left, and you're just along the coastline. And then you have the uh, Hebrew section, Israel. Uh, and we'll talk about Edom, Moab, and Ammon in our next study. Now on the right, you'll see a map that simply focuses on Phoenicia. And there you see the great cities of Phoenicia along the coast. Now let's come to the Bible. And let's come to the prophecies against both Tyre and Sidon, the two greatest cities in Phoenicia. These prophecies will date from 592 to 570. And that means that during that time, the Babylonians are going to take Judah into captivity. That's 586. And uh, so the, uh, there's a lot of action going on at this time. Let's look now at Ezekiel 26. Uh, this is really the, the portion 26, 27, that Ezekiel is going to focus his attention, as he is inspired to do so, on Tyre. Prophecy, therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. And her daughters on the mainland shall be killed by the sword then they will know that I am the Lord. He will kill with the sword your daughters on the mainland. He will set up a siege wall against you and throw up a mound against you and raise a roof of shields against you. Now, there's some things we should note in this slide before we progress. Uh, there's obviously a problem on God's part, something that Tyre has done, we'll look at that later, that causes God to bring this calamity upon them. Notice that there is a reference to the mainland, and that would imply there is an island 
We'll look at that in just a moment. And also in verse 6, you'll notice at the end of it, they will know that I am the Lord. This phrase appears over and over again in the prophecy of Ezekiel. He focuses, as God guides him by inspiration, uh, to bring out the knowledge and understanding that the Lord is indeed sovereign and, and cause people to know at least that he exists and hopefully also to believe in him. Uh, and so over and over again, the, the point is God brings calamity upon nations because of their sin with the purpose that the people will come to realize that God is truly the Lord. Well, what was the sin? What was the problem with Tyre? Well, Ezekiel explains it in the very first part of chapter 26. In the 11th year, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, because Tyre said concerning Jerusalem, Aha, the gate of the peoples is broken. It swung open to me. I shall be replenished now that she's laid waste. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers, and I will scrape her soil from her and make her a bare rock. She shall be in the midst of the sea, a place for the spreading of nets, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. And she shall become plunder for the nations, and her daughters on the mainland shall be killed by the sword. Then they will know that I am the Lord. You see again that phrase. Well, what's going on? I mentioned a moment ago that this is during the time that the Babylonians are going to invade Israel, invade Judah, and take the Jews captive into Babylon, destroying, of course, the temple. So when that happened, the people of Tyre rejoiced. I said a moment ago, there is not necessarily strong enmity between the Phoenicians and the Hebrews. But there was some trade, of course, that the Hebrews engaged in. Uh, that was certainly the case during the time of Solomon. So uh, what she's simply saying is, we've lost a competitor here. They're destroyed. We'll take up their trade, we will gain from it. The gate has swung open to us. <laughs> That's the idea. She's laid waste. And, and so they were rejoicing over the fall of Jerusalem. Now, God brought that calamity upon Jerusalem because of their sins, but it, God does not want people to rejoice in the, the sad fate of his people because they are still his people, even though he is bringing this punishment upon them, they are still his covenant people. And to be rejoicing and to be glad that they are suffering was offensive to God. And so, so offensive that God decides to destroy Tyre. And so in verses seven to nine, the mainland will be destroyed. Ezekiel continues. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I will bring against Tyre from the north, a name specifically from the north, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses and chariots and with horsemen and a host of many soldiers. He will kill with the sword your daughters on the mainland. He will set up a siege wall against you and throw up a mound against you and raise a roof of shields against you. He will direct the shock of his battering rams against your walls. And with his axes, he will break down your towers. It is interesting that over and over again, Ezekiel mentions the destruction of the daughters and uh, not the men, the soldiers. Evidently, that's a different category. The daughters are home trying to live a normal life. And he's going to, they're going to interrupt it. Nebuchadnezzar is the one coming. God will use Nebuchadnezzar not only against Judah, but against Tyre as well. Same person is going to destroy both cities. So uh, the mainland is going to be destroyed specifically by Nebuchadnezzar. The importance of Phoenician Tyre was her trade. That is exactly uh, the, the focus of her wealth and her activity and her very being. Trade by sea. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon laid siege to Tyre between 580 
5 and 573. Remember, it's 586 when Nebuchadnezzar takes the Jews into captivity. This is the next year that he lays siege to Tyre. And notice that it continues until 573. And as a result, Tyre was forced to acknowledge Babylonian oversight and Babylonian control. And later, when the Persians defeated the Babylonians, they will accept uh, Persian control over them. Uh, so the Babylonians simply had the hegemony over the whole region and the Persians later. All right. When Nebuchadnezzar broke the walls down, most of the inhabitants, realizing that Nebuchadnezzar was coming nearer, had actually fled from the mainland. They had moved to an island a half mile off the coast and fortified a city there. Now, here's where we come into the fact that we have an island as opposed to the mainland. And the mainland city was completely destroyed in 573. But the inhabitants had gone to this island, and Nebuchadnezzar was unable to take that island. He did lay siege to it, but it, he could not take it because he did not have a good enough navy. They were able to protect their island city. Now, the prophecy was that Tyre would be attacked by many nations. So not only will Tyre be attacked by the Babylonians, uh, but also by the Persians, and then by the Macedonians. So coming to the Macedonians in 333, when Alexander the Great was ruling the great empire that he created, after he had defeated the Persians at Issus in 333, he turned his attention to the Phoenician cities. And by the way, Alexander was able to defeat the great Persian empire in three battles, Granicus River, Issus and Galgamela, and this takes place between the second and third battles. But he decided he needed to remove Tyre because, of course, Tyre had a strong navy. And in this way, by diminishing Tyre, which is in league with Persia at this time, it's going to help him in winning the final battle. So he marched against the Phoenician cities, demanded their surrender. The island city, as you would think, refused. They were sitting confident in their island city without uh, any fear of being taken by an enemy. They had resisted Nebuchadnezzar. They had resisted the Persians, and now they will resist the Macedonians. But Al Alexander the Great had a plan. He demolished what was left of the old vacant city. Some of the buildings were still standing. And he took the debris, the stones. He took wood he took dirt and deposited all of that in the sea and with this he built a causeway actually to reach that half mile from the mainland city to the island city nebuchadnezzar lacking a navy had left it alone alexander has a great navy but he also has a good army and uh, he's able to uh, march soldiers across this causeway while his sailors and the Navy were, is able to uh, fire upon the island and, and give cover to the uh, soldiers crossing. So the people of Tyre were defended by the Persian fleet, but Alexander marched his army across the land bridge, which he completed in spite of the effort of the people of Tyre to sabotage the construction. Uh, as they were making their way, they're building this land bridge and naturally, the people on the, in the island are firing upon them, uh, sending uh, fiery arrows and things of that sort. And they're trying to stop them, but yet they're not able to stop them. And they complete it. So Alexander had enlarged his navy. He crossed the completed causeway with his army and defeated the island city of Tyre in 332. Now, interesting that the causeway that Alexander built remains today. Now, let's look at the map. You see on the right, the coast of the Levant, the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, and that's Phoenicia, and you see old Tyre there. And you see the causeway uh, that he has built from old Tyre to the island Tyre, the half a mile. And this took place in 332 BC. 
Now, this is interesting. What happened in the interim after Alexander built the causeway and after he conquered the island city, uh, the area filled up, as you might think, with dirt. Uh, and uh, gradually, this causeway grew into uh, this large area that you see here and really becomes a part of the mainland. So today, it really isn't an island. It is just uh, connected to the mainland. And uh, what is most fascinating is to realize that what Alexander did, unbeknownst to him, was the fulfillment of the prophecy of God through Ezekiel chapter 26, verse 12. Listen to this. This, this is the startling thing. This is the amazing thing. It's very, very specific. They will plunder your riches and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. Your stones and timber and soil, they will cast into the midst of the waters. Very specific, exactly what Alexander did. And I will stop the music of your songs, and the sound of your lyres shall be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock. You shall be a place for the spreading of nets. And that was written 250 years before the time of Alexander. And so, as Ezekiel continues, Tyre is going to be scraped and made bare. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. I will scrape her soil from her and make her a bare rock. She shall be in the midst of the sea, a place for the spreading of nets, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. And she shall become plunder for the nations, and her daughters on the mainland shall be killed by the sword. And then they will know that I am the Lord. And further, you shall never be rebuilt, for I am the Lord. I have spoken, declares the Lord God. And Tyre has never been rebuilt to this day. So uh, in fulfillment, when the island Tyre fell, 8,000 inhabitants were killed. They were completely unprepared for this uh, way, method of warfare, building a land bridge to them. And Tignus, one of Alexander's generals, general who was in charge of Greece, uh, will reduce Tyre in 314, which had subsequently recovered somewhat in the interim between 332 and 314. Then Ptolemy Philadelphus, uh, a Macedonian king of Greece, dealt Tyre a death blow and assumed their trade completely, which was now centered in Alexandria. And Alexandria, the city that Alexander the Great established, named for himself, and it's in Egypt, Alexandria now comes to dominate not only trade, but economy, education, everything. Alexandria becomes the greatest city in the world during this Hellenistic period, and certainly has replaced Tyre as the mistress of the sea. During the Crusades in 12. 91 AD, and I realize we're advancing now by around 1,500 years, but during the Crusades, the Muslims obliterated the city and massacred or sold into slavery its citizens because some were still living in Tyre. Tyre never recovered from that attack, and its destruction was so complete when the land was cleared of all structures that it became a place where fishermen spread their nets to dry exactly what Ezekiel prophesied those many years before. And since then, unsuccessful efforts were subsequently made to rebuild the city on its ancient site. None have been successful. So Ezekiel prophesies, thus says the Lord God, when I make you a city laid waste, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I bring up the deep over you and the great waters cover you, then I will make you go down with those who go down to the pit, to the people of old, and I will make you dwell in the world below, among ruins from of old, with those who go down to the pit, so that you will not be inhabited, but I will set beauty in the land of the living. I will bring you a dreadful end, and you shall be no more. Though you be sought for, you will never be found again, declares the Lord God. So, fulfillment. Although there is a small fishing village on the site of original Tyre, efforts to rebuild the city have been unsuccessful. 
After the final destruction in 1291, it died and was never rebuilt. Ezekiel 26 reveals seven definite and distinctive predictive prophecies. One, Nebuchadnezzar would destroy the mainland city. Two, many nations would come up against Tyre. Three, it would be made a bare rock, flat like the top of a rock. Four, fishermen would spread their nets over the site. Five, the debris would be thrown into the water. Six, it would never be rebuilt. And seven, it would never be found again. The chances of all seven of these prophecies coming to pass is one in 75 million, according to Peter Stoner. Now let's turn to Sidon. Sidon was a smaller city north of Tyre. And the prophecy in Ezekiel 28 says, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. God often addressed Ezekiel as son of man. Set your face towards Sodom and prophesy against her and say, Thus says the Lord God. Behold, I am against you, O Sidon, and I will manifest my glory in your midst. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I execute judgments in her and manifest my holiness in her. For I will send pestilence into her and blood into her streets and the slain shall fall in her midst by the sword that is against her on every side. And he repeats, then they will know that I am the Lord. So there's the prophecy. And Phoenician Sidon would suffer blood in her streets. This smaller city than Tyre, and Tyre controlled Sidon, we would think would be destroyed, and the great city of Tyre, much bigger, stronger, more populous, would survive. It's just the reverse. Tyre was destroyed. Nothing is said about the permanent destruction of Sidon. Sidon did become a vassal to Persia, did successfully, though, rebel against Persia, was able to continue and, and serve. The king of Sidon betrayed his people to Persia just to save his life, and 40,000 inhabitants of Sidon shut themselves in their houses and set fire to them, perishing rather than suffer at the hands of the Persians. Well, when did blood run in the streets, quite literally? Well, that happened during the Crusades. Once again, the Crusades seemed to be involved in the fulfillment of these prophecies. And during that time, it was taken three times by the Crusaders and then retaken by the Muslims. And it was during that time uh, that slaughter was so severe that blood ran in the streets. And then in 1840, it was bombarded by English, French, and Turks. And various enemies came against Sidon. And the city's the citizens of Sidon were often just butchered. But the city was always rebuilt. And, and today it exists with a population of about 15,000. So the specific predictions regarding Sidon, there's no mention of Sidon. And Sidon remains. Tyre was destroyed. Blood would run in the streets. We see the fulfillment of that. The sword would strike on every side. And we see the many people that have come against Sidon. And yet it still survived. That's the case throughout. When God would say this city will be destroyed or this nation will be destroyed and never be built again. That's the case. It never is built again and inhabited. But if he doesn't say that, that nation will survive. Now, Philistia, the move to Philistia, coming down south on the coast. Uh, you've seen this slide before because I uh, mentioned it. We were talking about Assyria and Nineveh, mentioning that Nimrod was the uh, founder, which says the beginning of the kingdom. It mentions Babel, Akkad, the Akkadians, and Nineveh. And if you come down to the last verse here, 14, you will notice that Egypt, who was one of the sons of uh, Ham, uh, fathered Ludum and so forth. And in the red, you will notice the last two, Kazlehim and Kaftorhim. Uh, these two cities are associated with the Philistines. Uh, you know, the Bible here clearly says that the Philistines came from Kazlehim, but also we read that many scholars believe they came from Kaftorhim. I don't think we have a contradiction because these two brothers seem to be very closely related to uh, the, to each other in terms of their living and act, activity. And uh, it, it's natural, it's possible that they have ancestors coming from both these cities. 
So I think both of them can claim to be the ancestors of the uh, Philistines. Now here's Philistia. And on this, you'll see the major cities of Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ashdod. And you will see the mentioning of these three cities as we go through the scriptures and the prophecies. In addition, you see Ekron, and there are several other cities within that territory of the Philistines. Uh, moving now from that time of uh, the prophecies relating to Babylon, uh, during the Isaiah's time, Philistia, uh, the leading cities right on the coast would be Ekron, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, and Raphia. Very interesting that the latter two uh, are involved in events, political events today. Well, the development takes place in Philistia. Uh, we've noted that the Philistines probably descended from Kazlehim people and or the Kaphorite people. And they were on Crete, the island of Crete, which by the way is the fifth among the earliest civilizations. Uh, it is later than the first four, but it is listed as, the, as among the first, certainly the first of the European civilizations. And then uh, we have noted uh, Kaslehim and Kaftarim as being the uh, descended from uh, Egypt and thus from Ham. And also the word Philistine is actually the Greek word for Palestine or Palestine comes from and derives from the word Philistine. They were active on the coastal areas of the Levant, very similar uh, to Phoenicia from about 1100 to 300. Now the difference between Phoenicia and Philistia here is that they, the Philistines were land focused, whereas the Phoenicians are sea focused, a thousocracy. And since they were land focused and since they are uh, tangent with uh, Israel, and Israel is just to the east of them, they became bitter rivals of Israel. And there is bitter, serious conflict between the Philistines and Israel. Certainly, we can see that in the time of David fighting against Goliath and, and fighting against the Philistines generally. Uh, those battles go on and on. We know there's a time when the Philistines actually captured the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, so this is an extreme conflict that exists between the Philistines and the Hebrews. Now notice in the prophets that are listed at the top of this slide. All of them issued prophecies against Philistia. Very interesting. I think that indicates how serious the threat was from the Philistines and how much God was uh, concerned with uh, protecting his people. And they're very fascinating uh, prophecies. They differ a little bit, but they, they all focus on the Philistine cities. So the Philistine cities were active during the time when the prophets of Israel and Judah were making most of their pronouncements. Because the Philistines were not a thousocracy, they tended to look landward for expansion, which brought them into contact and thus conflict with Israel. They seem to have reached their zenith during the United Monarchy, the time of David, and so the conflict was during that time extremely intense. Let's we'll start with Isaiah and his prophecy against Philistia. In the year that King Ahaz died came this oracle. Rejoice not, O Philistia, all of you, that the rod that struck you is broken. For from the serpent's root shall come forth an adder, and its fruit will be a flying, fiery serpent. A little bit hard for us to figure out exactly to, to whom he refers, uh, but it would seem that this adder uh, that uh, is under consideration would be uh, Assyria, and it was broken, and they were rejoiced, of course, at that, but when Assyria is broken, then we're going to have Babylon coming along. Continuing in verse 30, and the firstborn of the poor will graze and the needy lie down in safety, but I will kill your root with famine and your remnant it will slay. Wail, O gate, cry out, O city, melt in fear, O Philistia, all of you, for smoke comes out of the north and there is no straggler in his ranks. 
And whether we're speaking of Assyria or Babylon, of course, geographically, both are north of Philistia. What will one answer the messengers of the nation? The Lord has founded Zion, and in her the afflicted of his people find refuge. Well, here's Ezekiel. We've seen many of his prophecies. What does he say about the Philistines? Thus says the Lord God, because the Philistines acted revengefully and took vengeance with malice of soul to destroy in never-ending enmity. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines, and I will cut off the Kerasites and destroy the rest of the seacoast, and I will execute great vengeance on them with wrathful rebukes. Then they will know that I am the Lord, as we see Ezekiel again and again, seeing this as the end result of the God's uh, woe that he brings upon his enemies. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon them. Well, let's go to Amos. If you remember, we looked at Amos in our very first study. And Amos 1, 6, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Gaza, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they carried into exile a whole people to deliver them to Edom. Uh, scholars are not sure exactly what people are under consideration, but there were occasions when the people of Gaza did this very, very thing. And some of the people who were carried away were the Jews, some of the Jews, uh, about the same time Babylon was in invading. So I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, and it shall devour their strongholds. I will cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod, and him who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. So Amos addresses four of the key cities of the Philistines. Well, here's Zephaniah. Zephaniah says, For Gaza shall be deserted, and Ashkelon shall become a desolation. Ashdod's people shall be driven out at noon, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to you, inhabitants of the seacoast, you nation of the Kerasites! The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan and land of the Philistines, and I will destroy you until no inhabitant is left. And you, O seacoast, shall be pastures, with meadows for shepherds and folds for flocks. The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah, on which they shall graze, and in the houses of Ashkelon they shall lie down at evening. For the Lord their God will be mindful of them and restore their fortunes. Woe to Philistines, weal to Israel. And here is Zechariah. Ashkelon shall see it and be afraid. Gaza too and shall writhe in anguish. Ekron also, because its hopes are confounded. The king shall perish from Gaza. Ashkelon shall be uninhabited. A mixed people shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of Philistia, will take away the blood from its mouth and its abominations from between its teeth. It too shall be a remnant for our God. It shall be a, like a clan in Judah, and Ekron shall be like the Jebusites. And Jeremiah, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning the Philistines before Pharaoh struck down Gaza. And Pharaoh is one of the countries that God used uh, to bring down the Philistines. Thus says the Lord, behold, waters are rising out of the north and shall become an overflowing torrent. They shall overflow the land and all that fills it the city and those that dwell in it, and coming from the north, again, could be Assyria and or Babylon. Men shall cry out, and every inhabitant of the land shall wail at the noise of the stamping of the hoofs of his stallions, at the rushing of his chariots, at the rumbling of their wheels. The fathers look not back to their children, so feeble are their hands, because of the day that's coming to destroy all the Philistines to cut off from Tyre and Sidon every helper that remains. For the Lord is destroying the Philistines, the remnant of the coastland of Kafshar. Baldness has come upon Gaza. Ashkelon has perished. O remnant of their valley, how long will you gash yourselves? Ah, sword of the Lord, how long till you are quiet? Put yourself into your scabbard. Rest and be still. How can it be? It be quiet when the Lord has given it a charge against Ashkelon and against the seashore 
he has appointed it. Well, all of these prophecies against the Philistines uh, really it sounds quite serious. And how was it fulfilled? Well, of course, Egypt did come against the Philistines under Pharaoh Necho and also Nebuchadnezzar. There were others, but these are the two major ones. And as a result, Philistia was thoroughly conquered. But we need to note one thing. There are specific prophecies here. Gaza and Ashkelon, particularly, the Philistines would not continue. Baldness would come upon Gaza. Desolation would come on Ashkelon. Shepherds and sheep would dwell in the area around Ashkelon. And the remnant of the house of Judah would re-inhabit Ashkelon. That happened. But to look more in detail at the destruction and how it occurred, this comment Perhaps Pharaoh Necho of Egypt attacked Gaza sometime in 602 BC, which would have been an incursion into Babylonian territory because Nebuchadnezzar subdued the Philistines in 604. That is two years after the Babylonians took over. But the prophecy in Jeremiah 47, which we noted a moment ago, appears to have been delivered after that time. Indeed, there's a hint of the fact that a remnant of Ashkelon is here mentioned. The Philistines, which have already been attacked, are going to be hit again. Notice the specific reason here, to cut off from Tyre and Sidon every helper who remains. They were helping, and this, they're going to stop that. This provides us with the time of the destruction mentioned. Within a year of the conquest of Jerusalem, 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to the island portion of Tyre, which we saw earlier, 585, having already brought Sidon, Arvad, and the mainland portion of Tyre under his control shortly before. The siege lasted for 13 years. So this prophecy refers to the overrunning of Philistia by Nebuchadnezzar's armies around the time of the fall of Judah. And you see from 586 all the way down to 573. As with Egypt, Though Babylon is the agent of destruction, God is the one who brings it. And so the fascinating destruction of the Philistines and uh, the conquest of Tyre. Next week, I want us to turn to Edom, Moab, and Ammon, uh, incorporated within the area that's generally assigned to Israel, but we'll see the relationship they have to Israel and the prophecies that deal with them. Thank you for your interest.